Heavenly Father, I pray that you bless this day. I pray, Lord, that uh, all that's said and done will bring the honor and glory. Be with the kids in Sunday school and um, those that are listening today. If there's anybody that doesn't know you as their Savior, may they make peace with you today and just uh, strengthen your church, strengthen your people. In Jesus' name, amen. And I want to say uh, happy birthday to my lovely wife. Today is her birthday. So, amen. And my wonderful son-in-law, his birthday was yesterday. So Justin over there and Renee are a day apart. Okay, today we're going to uh, turn in your Bible to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation 20, I am going to continue down through history. And this will be history future, the future, because we already looked at a lot of history past in the scripture. I went... I went all the way through from the beginning, and I've been talking about the timetable and how time is going to unfold and what the events are going to be. Now, I'll, I'll do a quick summary because I don't want to get too uh, involved in the past. I don't want to live in the past here. I don't want to get too involved in, in what has already happened, but basically where we are in the timeline of history. And according to Clarence Larkin, who's one of the the greats when it comes to prophecy. He says we're in a very young, young period in history. Uh, and when you think about it, no matter how you slice it, man is kind of young because you think about, well, people say, well, we've been here a long time. No, we're really young because when we think about our eternal future, we have a long, long time ahead of us, don't we? So eternity itself and the earth and all of that, there's much, much more to come. See, everybody, the world right now is in panic mode through global warming and everything going on. We're destroying the earth, this, that, everything else. This earth is going to be destroyed. I mean, period, end. It's going to be destroyed. So the earth you're sitting on will be destroyed. Now, there are people who believe in what is called an annihilation theory. Anybody ever hear that? Annihilation theory? I believe the Jehovah's Witnesses are big on that. They believe that the earth is going to be blown up and destroyed and everything on it now and then something new made a new heaven and new earth will be made the earth you're sitting on will remain now you say well pastor that's confusing you just said it'd be destroyed okay hear me out what we're sitting on is approximately 22 miles of the earth's crust okay god has to burn up part of that crust He's going to make it brand new. He's not going to destroy the core of it, although the whole thing could be changed. The earth in itself will remain. It will just be changed, and it will be burned up, and, and it will be purified. Okay? So what God wants to do through his burning up of the place, he wants to purify it. It's kind of like taking silver and putting it into the fire. The silver isn't destroyed. What happens? The silver is purified. Then you do it again, and you do it seven times until all of that junk comes out of the silver. That's what God's going to do to the earth. He's going to remove all the junk. Is that simple? Okay, I try to make it as simple as possible. And he's going to do the same to the heavens. Now, the heavens themselves are like his vesture. God is so awesome that God wears, like today I have a shirt on and a tie, and if I had a sport coat, that would be my vesture and i'd and i'd be clothed with that people may say hey that's a nice suit or i don't like that suit whatever it's my vesture christ had a vesture god the father has a vesture okay and his vesture is heaven the stars the sun the moon all of it he wears it like i would wear a coat <clears throat> one day he's going to say i'm tired of this my clothes have gotten old. I'm going shopping. Amen, ladies. I'm, go I'm going shopping. I'm going to buy myself some new clothes. And he's going to make it new. <clears throat> How do I know that? Because the Bible tells me, but where does it say that? Anybody? In the book of Hebrews. And we'll go and look at that passage. So let's go to the beginning real quick and come to where we are right now. <clears throat> Adam and Eve. Before them, what was it? What was before Adam and Eve? 
Juan, I'll, I'll make this interactive. I want to see what you've learned. What was before Adam and Eve? Angels. Book of Job. Book of Job, right? The angels rejoiced when God made the earth. So you know the timing of the creation of the angels. Heavenly beings were created before the earth because they were here to rejoice with God when he made the earth. Job clearly states that, okay? In the beginning, God. Then came the heavenly hosts. One day he decided his legs were tired or something. He needed a place to sit. So he made himself a throne. He sat on it. Then he decided, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heaven. So the third heaven, that's where he lives. So the third heaven was first before the other two. Because the other two didn't come till Genesis chapter one when God made the firmament and then he put in second, first heaven, okay? So then we get to Adam and Eve. God says, I want to make man. He puts the creatures on the earth, Adam and Eve. And then they begin, of course they fall. Death comes, unfortunately. But fortunately for us, Christ came. Amen. To turn the effects of that around and make actually death a blessing to us all. When you think about it, if you're saved, death will be a blessing to you because you're going to be like Christ. It just that, that's crazy when you even think about that. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Then we get to Abraham and we run through history. Well, Noah, Abraham, we go up through Jacob. Then we get to Moses. The law comes. And we talked about the law. We talked about righteousness not being by the law, but people had to uphold the law. And if they didn't, they couldn't make it in. So they had to live by the law and they still had that faith in God. And then we got to Christ. Okay. John the Baptist being the forerunner of Jesus laid out the red carpet for Jesus to come. We get to Jesus and then he dies, resurrects. Pentecost comes. The Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. Church begins. We begin preaching the new birth that people need to be saved. And we've been preaching that since the church began. <clears throat> We're gonna be celebrating Pentecost here in a couple weeks, a few weeks. So Pentecost, and then the church made up mostly of Gentiles, mostly, began with Jews. Maybe could end with more Jews towards the end as the Jews begin to get dealt with by the Lord. Time of Jacob's trouble. What's the next great event we're waiting on? the rapture. The Lord could call us, boom, we go out of here. If you're saved, you're going. If you're lost, you're staying. Simple as I can put it. Tribulation comes seven years. During that time, men have to work the whole way through the end, not to receive the mark, nor to give in to the Antichrist system. The Bible says if you take the mark, you'll be damned. Okay. And the Lord will send strong delusion upon those that didn't believe the truth. So when you preach to people today and they reject it, they only got so many chances, and they get to that tribulation, and the Lord says, oh, you didn't believe. You didn't accept. You had every chance you needed, and he sends a strong delusion, like a cloud comes over them, and they believe it. They believe the lie, and you can see the lie being spun in the world today. <clears throat> it's, it's coming. You can see it coming. Who in here is watching? You can see it all coming. The media is shaping it up. Politicians are pulling it together. Somebody's behind all of this. Someone. And they're dictating the orders. And the media is following suit. The politicians are following suit. They're prepping the world for what's to come. And that what, what is to come is one man over the whole world as Antichrist. As Antichrist. Okay? Seven-year tribulation, mark of the beast at the end, Armageddon. Then after Armageddon, what happens? That beautiful time called the millennium. How long? A thousand years. And what reigns? What's the character of that? What, what did I say? One word. Peace. Peace is the, is the, is the character, is the, is the number one trait, is the... Is, the name basically of the millennium, it's peace because the Prince of Peace is here. Okay. Peace. And the world's at peace because there's no devil. Where did he go? He got bound for a thousand years. Okay. Imagine that a world without the devil. Whew. Almost can't even fathom what, what it could be like. 
And then I went into the millennium and talked about all the good things that are going to come in the millennium. The reaper overtaking the sower, the lion, the wolf, the tigers, the bears, no longer having that anger, no, no longer having that aggression, <clears throat> but everything being at peace. Okay. And then we get all the way through there. Men are living long, right? Up to a thousand years. They're going to live. So something's going to change. When the Lord comes at Armageddon, second coming, the Lord's going to change something in the atmosphere or something in the water to cause men to live a long time. So then we go all the way to the end. We get to the end of the millennium. And what happens at the end of the millennium? The devil gets out. He goes to the four corners of the world, earth, and he gathers together Gog and Magog. And there's a great war. And at that war, fire comes down from God out of heaven. And I told you that I felt that was the beginning of the great judgment. Okay? Because the earth has to be purified with fire. All right? Now, I'm going to go to those verses, and that's where we're going to pick it up right here. I'm going to pick it up at the war. The war, Gog and Magog, he goes and he gathers together all of the armies of the world who are waiting for him. And he pulls them together and they march against Israel. And the Bible says the fire of God comes down from heaven and destroys them all. Let's go to Revelation chapter 20 and we'll pick it up right here. Any questions? <clears throat> go on. <clears throat> yes. <clears throat> well, Men may become vegetarian in the millennium. They might, because the earth is going to bring forth such bounty. I'm not sure. I'd have to search those scriptures. But as, as you said about the fish, <clears throat> the Lord's going to multiply the animal. The fish will be everywhere. God will multiply the oceans again, repopulate it all. So don't sit around and worry about the earth. Just don't do it. <clears throat> you got other things you need to be more concerned about. Don't worry about the earth. That's God's. It doesn't say the earth is Pastor Dragonette. It doesn't say the earth is Dave's. It doesn't say the earth is Cokie's. The earth is who? The earth is the Lord's. And the what? Fullness thereof. All God has to do is breathe or think it, and tuna will appear mackerel so somebody will say holy mackerel <laughs> holy mackerel <laughs> they'll go more than holy mackerel holy sharks holy tuna holy bonitas like uh, like crazy the lord just be teeming the earth he'll make the rivers and the lakes and the oceans teem with fish won't that be wonderful that'd be incredible so can you fish? I hope. I hope. Oh, God, please. No. <clears throat> I'm not living for God all this life to, you know, give up fishing and stuff and other things I love, you know, to get there and he's saying, nah, no fishing permitted. I don't want to see those signs. <laughs> okay, let's go. Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20 and verse number seven. It says, and when the thousand years are expired, this is good for everyone to read here because this is really some good stuff. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. So he's bound for a thousand years. And that's in the early part of that chapter. And shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. So think about all these people that are going to revolt against God. It's incredible to think it, but it will happen. And they went up on the breath of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Okay, so fire. Now you notice something here that happens right after this. It says, and the devil that deceived them was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Think about how there's only like four verses there that Satan gets to enjoy four, four verses. How much time he gets out, he goes to deceive them. They all march on Israel. I don't know how long that takes, 
fire of God comes down, he's taken, thrown into the lake of fire. Pretty quick. Pretty quick and pretty decisive. God has had it. And all these people were burned up with fire. At this time, it looks, this is what I think happened. If we go to Peter, it'll talk about the heavens are going to melt with a fervent heat. The earth and the heaven are going to melt with a fervent heat. And the fire of God is going to, to dissolve it. It appears at this point, that's what, that is for, beginning to get fulfilled right here. When the fire of God comes down, he begins to purge the earth. And that's what I believe is going to happen here. Because at the same time, bodies are taken off the earth. Okay. And we're going to get the transition here. After right here, we get to verse 11. It says, and I saw a great white throne. This is the final judgment. So it looks like the fire of God falls. And John, while this fire is falling, he sees a great white throne. And all of a sudden, he sees all these bodies of people standing before the great white throne. So in my estimation of what happens, after the thousand years are done, the revolt, fire comes down from God, the judgment is set, the books are opened, and while we're up there at the judgment, the whole world, all, all the earthlings who have ever lived will be there. That means not one body will be here on the earth. Not one. Understand? I'm going to prove it to you. I will show you in the scripture. If you want to take notes, these are very good notes because you have to do an exhaustive study to see these verses if you wanted them. So if you, we're going to go to them. The Bible says the earth shall cast out the dead. So if we go back to the beginning of time, Adam and Eve are buried somewhere, aren't they? Where? I'd say somewhere in the Middle East, somewhere in the Garden of Eden, somewhere near the Tig Tigris and Euphrates River, somewhere in there. Does God know where? Is Adam coming out? Is Eve coming out? Right here. Now, say, well, they may not come out here. They may come out at a different resurrection. Okay? And I believe those Old Testament saints will live through the millennium. So I think Adam and Eve are going to be resurrected before the millennium. But people who die in the millennium and those that aren't saved, their bodies have to be resurrected. Every body. Now, a lot of people say, well, pastor, just, just the bodies of the saved people are the only ones coming back. God's going to get rid of all the bodies from the earth, bodies of saved and unsaved alike. Okay. All bodies. Okay. So it says in verse number 11, then <clears throat> I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face, the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead small and great stand before God. You ever wonder what they're standing on? Are they standing on anything? Doesn't say. They just stand before God. Imagine if they're standing on nothing. Who's going to make the final decision for them? You see, when your feet are planted on something, you feel secure, don't you? So if their feet were planted on a sea of glass or somewhere in heaven planted, they would feel secure, wouldn't they? But if their feet are not planted on anything, and you're just hovering, do you feel secure? Because you're saying to yourself, what? Who's holding me up? How am I doing this? And God says, it's your turn to be judged. And he lays down the condemnation. And all of a sudden, he's done with his judgment. And what happens? Nothing's holding you up anymore, is it? And you fall. 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 And there's a little red spot that you see. And you fall. And you fall. And you fall. What happens at red spot? It grows as you fall. And it grows. And it grows. And it grows. And it grows. And you get hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter until 
you hit it. You say, wow, pastor, I never thought about it that way. Could happen that way. It could be instantaneous. We don't know. But let's read on. It says, and I saw the dead, small and great. That's everybody, okay? Stand before God. And the books were opened. Now, when I say everybody, I clarify, it's all the dead who have ever lived, except we won't be judged here. Because if you're saved, you'll be judged before this. Our judgment occurs at the judgment seat of Christ in the clouds. So if the rapture were to happen right now, we would go to our judgment immediately in the clouds. Different judgment. This judgment encompasses everybody who's never been judged up to this point. Okay, so, and I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. So God's a God of books. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. See, works is involved here. A lot of millennial stuff. Because you don't have to have faith in the millennium because Christ is on earth. So a lot of millennial people will be here. They're going to be judged according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. Death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to what? He says again, their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Boy, what a small verse, but how powerful, huh? Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So the question is, is your name in the book of life? Is your name in the book of life? When you're sure, you're sure, right? That you know you have eternal life. I praise God. Kevin Dragonak is in God's book of life. September 21st, 1976, when I prayed, the Lord said, oh, that young man wants to be saved. I don't know who wrote it in there. One of his scribes, or maybe he did. I don't know. Kevin, and he spelled Dragonac right, too. <laughs> he didn't put the O in there. Dragonac. He put Dragan, A and A C. And he wrote it in there. And when I get to heaven, boy, that's going to be a beautiful sight, isn't it? Amen. Lord, can I look? Yeah, go ahead, take a look. Oh, wow. What a beautiful sight. What a beautiful sight. Won't that be beautiful, Joshy? Josh, Joshua Kane. What's your middle name? Eric, Joshua, Eric Kane. Benjamin, David, right? Benjamin, David, Kane. Wow. Hey, my name is there. Written in the book of life. Okay, now here's my question about this judgment. Does everybody at this judgment get cast in the lake of fire? Who says yes? Who says no? Okay. Who makes it then? So let's take the millennium. Let's just, let's just take a little carve out here of the millennium. We got a millennial person. Person, the millennium is a thousand years. We got them being judged because they haven't been judged yet, right? This is the first judgment after the millennium. It's the last one, but it's the first one to follow the millennium. So a thousand years worth of people are judged here. If they did what they were supposed to during the millennium, God will let them enter into life. So everybody here, because the thought was with the, when I was first saved, everybody at this judgment's condemned. No, they're not. Now the Bible does say, blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection because this is the second resurrection here. So automatically you think, oh, I don't want to be part of the second resurrection. We're going to be part of the first one. But the millennial saints are going to be part of the second one. Okay. And the reason they are is because when they're, when they're born, they're going to be judged here. You notice death and hell are judged. So after this, something happens to sin, death, and hell. So now what are we doing here? We're starting to cross over into the world to come. The millennium's done. Now what? And this is where it gets cloudy to all of us, doesn't it? 
We got that up to the great white throne, but what happens after that? What happens to the earth? What happens to heaven? What do we do? Now, I'll say this. I have a very good understanding of the scripture up until the great white throne. When we get after that, my prophetic eyes get a little bit dim. It's hard to tell what's going to happen way, way after that. Now, we're eternal beings, right? So if you're saved, you're going to live forever with God. But what's it going to be like in a million years from now? What's it going to be like? What, what's God going to do? Okay, now, I told you my prophetic eyes get a little bit dim and weak. But what I can envision, let's take 50,000 years from now. When all of this is done, okay, I envision, according to what I read in the scripture, that men, as we'll see, heaven's going to come down to the earth. There is a city that is 15,000 miles, or 1,500 miles square, okay? This city has 12 gates and pearls. It has doors on it and walls, the gates and walls, and the city has no need of the sun because God's going to dwell amongst us. Now you say, well, pastor, how long is 1,500 miles square? If we drew a line from Maine all the way down to Florida and we went over past the Mississippi, 600 miles past it, say to Texas, over in that area, Louisiana, down in there, and we went up, okay? 600 miles west of the Mississippi, and we came across back to Maine, we would have about half of the United States landmass. Okay? Imagine that as a pyramid. And imagine that pyramid hovering above the earth. And men and women can go, and kids can go up into that city. Okay? This is what's prophesied of God. Now, you say, well, but if we go 50,000 years or 100,000 years from now, we're going to have so many people, right? Because aren't people going to continue to procreate? Aren't we going to have people all over the place? The question comes, where will everybody live? What was God, God's intention from the beginning? His intention from the beginning was, just not to populate the earth, but to populate heaven as well. Do you think he just made the planets so people could look at them through telescopes? Didn't he make the planets to be occupied? What does man want to do right now? Man wants to go to what planet? He wants to go to Mars. We have any interest here? Anybody want to go to Mars? You're the weather person. You like it out there. <laughs> she likes the weather on Earth. Okay. Anybody have any desire to go to the moon? We have any aspiring astronauts in here? You want your spine to grow six inches. You're not worried about going. So he's tall. Okay. We need to pray his spine grows six inches. I got one person to put her hand, put his hand up. Sean back here. He was finally he's me. Okay. What's that? You'd love to go out in space. Okay. So maybe there are people say, I'd go to Mars. I'd love to live on that colony out there and be out there. Doesn't man want to do it? Isn't man constantly out there trying to find life and all this stuff? If, if it's in his heart, don't you think it was in God's heart? Okay. Now what I envision is, is that one day God will permit man to inhabit planets and he will change the oxygen levels and everything that's out there so man can live out there because man's going to continue to have flesh. This is where, this is where the cloudiness comes. When we're all spirits and after the great white throne, does man have a fleshly body like we currently have now? 
what kind of body are we going to have? Is the Lord going to permit people to continue to have children and procreate? It sure seems like that from the Bible, because we can only envision life the way it is here. That's, this is like the Old Testament prophets looking at us and saying they understood everything about us. They don't. They don't. And we can't understand everything about that either. So let's just real quickly in the next five minutes here, and I'm going to be closed. Let's look at the earth casting out the dead. I want to go back. Just I'm going to cover all this. I'm, I got a lot of stuff. So I, over the next couple of weeks or so, I'm going to look at this uh, and, and continue on with this. stuff. Who's in, everyone enjoying this? Because if you aren't, I'll stop it. I really, I, I could make this the last one and say, I'll close shop on this. Believe me, I don't, I just don't want to get you bored. I don't want to get you bored. If I start seeing people, if I start seeing that, that I'm going to close up shop and go in a different direction. So believe me, I'll do that. And the reason I understand you is because I was where you were. I was where you were for a long time and heard a lot of teaching and preaching. And sometimes with it, the preacher wants to exhaust it, but in the end, he exhausts the congregation. So don't want to do that either. Okay, so let's look at some things here. Let's go with the earth casting out the dead and all this stuff. Let's go to Isaiah 26. All right, so Isaiah 26. I want you to get, all right, I'm going to keep you alive here. I get Isaiah, John, Daniel, and Jude. <clears throat> oh, come on. Isaiah, John, Daniel, and Jude. And when you got them, just say amen so I know everybody's there. In five minutes, I'll get an amen. All right, I got three of them. I don't have enough fingers. I said John, Jude, Isaiah, and Revelation. No, I said Isaiah, John, Daniel, and Jude. Okay, I got them. Everyone got them? We'll start with Isaiah. Everyone there? Give me the green light. Come on. All right. Isaiah, John, Daniel, Jude. Isaiah 26. Let's go there first. Okay. Isaiah 26, verse 19. All right. We ready? Thy dead men shall what? Live. Together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing. Ye that dwell in dust, for thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Cast it out. So the dead are coming out. How many of the dead? Let's go to Daniel. Daniel chapter 12. Daniel 12. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. At that time shall Michael, who is he? He's the archangel. At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And right there's a little nugget for you. Daniel, or I mean, uh, Michael is the protector of Israel. He's the archangel, but his primary duty is to protect the nation of Israel. Okay. He stands for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble. That's a tribulation, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time, and at that time, thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. See how books are important to God? And many of them, we're in Daniel 12, verse 2 now. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. That tells you right there what kind of people are coming out. Believers and non-believers wicked and godly they're going to awake how crazy that's going to be when someone who doesn't know the lord is their savior their molecules are put back together their body comes back together and they wake up in the earth and they're looking around and all of a sudden their body takes off they have no idea where they're going and at the time their body takes off their soul their soul's let out of hell and their soul meets their body and stands before god that's what happened. Two parts of them. Their spirit already went to God. At death, remember, when a person dies, their spirit goes back to God. The soul of an unsaved person goes to hell. The body goes to the grave. So here, the earth spits out that unsaved person. Their soul 
the earth spits out their soul. And as the smoke of the, there's, there's the fire still on their soul, I can picture them standing before God and the smoke of their torment still coming up out of them. And their bodies put together with their soul and there they stand before God, not knowing what's going on. Their judgment is set, okay? Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness. Are you a soul winner? Are you? And they that turn many to righteousness. You're going to shine as the stars forever and ever. The more you win, the more you shine. Think about that next time you go witness. You say, well, I, I have a hard time witnessing. I have a hard time witnessing. People threaten me. People do this. People do that. You want to shine? Take it for God. Yeah, they took that gospel track he gave them and threw it on the ground and stamped on top of it. Don't you think the Lord sees that? You'll shine. Wow, look how bright that person is. Why are they shining so much? I can barely look at them. As they turn many to righteousness. Okay, let's go to John. Let's go to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. John 5. Verse 28. John 5, 28. Now it said some that dwell, right? In Daniel, many. Many that dwell in the dust. Here, Jesus changes it, and he says in John 5, Marvel 28, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. What's Jesus say? Everybody. And shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation, okay? First and second resurrections. Lord says all that are in the earth, in the graves, are going to come out. Now, let's go to Jude, because I'm going to stop this here with this verse. In Jude, verse number six, the question comes, if man's going to be judged, what about angels? And when are angels going to be judged? When are angels going to be judged? And who's going to judge them? So are we going to judge angels at our judgment? When are angels judged? Angels are judged at the great white throne. It's a judgment for man, and it's a judgment for angels. And I'll tell you this, it's going to be strange. God is going to judge man. And I don't know the timing of who's going to go first, but let's say he does man and all man's done. And the Lord says, could you imagine the last person? He goes by A through Z. And you say, I had to be Z. <laughs> yes, Mr. Mr. Z, 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 Y, Z, Z, Y, Y, Z. Mr. Z, Z. You're the last guy. <sighs> the Lord says, you made it through the millennium, Mr. Zizzes, and you were, you just knocked it out of the park, Mr. Zizzes. Go into life. And he's the last guy. And he goes in. <laughs> and the Lord says, all the, all the people are judged. Now, he gathers all the angels. And the Lord may move his throne out of the way and say, Renee, it's your birthday today. Renee, you're up. And my wife says, I never liked the spotlight, Lord. Well, it's your turn. You see all these angels before you? There's 35 angels. I put them under your jurisdiction. I want you to judge him. You say, oh, come on. What does God say? What's he say? Is there credence to what I just said? Know ye not that what? He shall judge 
angels? How can you not judge the least things in the church? No, you're not. You're going to judge angels? My wife says, oh, that's nice. Yeah, yeah I like that. Go home today. Yeah, wow, that's really something. It is something, isn't it? God puts that much stock in his saints that you're going to judge the angels. Now, the question is, are we going to judge the good ones with the bad? Are we going to judge the good angels with the fallen angels? Or is this a judgment of the fallen angels, just the fallen angels? That's the question. Angels are perfect, aren't they? No sin in them. But yet, what does God charge his angels with? Folly. He doesn't put his tr put the trust in his trust in saints, and he charges his angels with folly. So, wow, I don't know. That's crazy thought, but I know that at least the fallen angels will be judged, and they'll be judged here. Jude chapter six or verse six. Jude six. It says, "And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation." He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness until the judgment when of the great day. So the great white throne is also called the judgment of the great day. This is the judgment of the great day of God Almighty. Okay, now here's what we're going to do next week. God willing, I can I'll continue on with this because I want to go Ascension Sundays in two weeks. So I might change up for that date. Not sure. But next week, I'm going to pick it up, and I'm going to try not to summarize as much next week. I'm going to pick it up with God making all things new, okay? God making all things new, and that's where I'll pick it up for next week, okay? All right, I hope you got a blessing.